Welcome to Slammed, a Boston Celtics podcast, and we are coming to you following a very disappointing 122-84 to Boston Celtics loss to the Mavs in Game 4 of the NBA Finals. Extremely disappointing if you, like me, thought that this was going to be the game that the Celtics swept the Finals and that Dallas was ready to just roll over like Luca on the floor after a bad call. I'm Megan Adelini from WEI, joined as always by Esteban Bustios from GBH and Justin Turpin from WEI. You guys are both boots on the ground down in Dallas. So I want to ask you, is there anything to the notion that perhaps Boston, the Celtics, the Jays, All the supporting staff came into this game four where they were up three to zero, knowing that history was on their side, knowing that Kyrie maybe gave them the best that he could in game three, thinking, hey, we got this. It's in the bag that maybe the mentality wasn't there and they were feeling themselves a little bit too much. I mean, I think it's certainly a possibility. I was saying throughout this whole series uh, even after game three i think dallas wins one so that came true i didn't think it was gonna happen like this and you know jason kidd said after the game the hardest thing to do is close the door in the nba i think I, I think you can't really don't chalk it up to much more than that just it's hard it's hard to, as joe Missoula, his famous quote you're, when you're uh, about to win, that's when it's most dangerous. I'm I'm butchering that quote, but you know what I mean. I think that's all. That's all it was, and and uh, a snowflake became an avalanche real quick for for Boston tonight. An avalanche in Texas. Who knew? Who knew that could happen? I certainly didn't know it was possible because it's so hot here. But I don't think that really factored into it. To be honest, I thought at the beginning it was really one team making their shots, another team missing their shots, and then that spiraled out of control. Because usually water finds its level with the Celtics, where they'll start making their shots. That didn't happen tonight for whatever reason, and maybe it was the defense. Because at times the defense wasn't great, and we talk about it all the time on the show. The con- connectivity of the game, where the defense isn't working, the offense is going to pay for it, and there was a problems on that end at times. But for the most part team just wasn't making their shots and some nights you really do just get outplayed and the Celtics were talking about that at the podium where every single player that went to the podium even Joe Missoula mentioned how well Dallas played and that's why they're here they're here for a reason and there is a truth to that but I do get the frustration that you have a chance to close out and you lose by what 37 38 points that 38 I get the frustration yeah I I wonder when you say usually with the Celtics team the number of three-point shots that they take, that water finds its level. Somebody usually gets something going. There was a point even in the third quarter where it looked like, hey, maybe Drew Holiday is going to find something here. And at that point, it felt a little bit too late for the Celtics. But I wonder how much credit you guys give to what looked to me like a totally different defensive effort from the Mavs. And perhaps part of that is a combination of the Celtics riding high on their confidence, but also on the other side, the the Mavericks coming in from an obvious place of desperation. We talked on our radio show this afternoon a little bit on WEI with Jones and Mega with Arcan about in that last series when the Mavericks were seeing Minnesota. And of course, yes, Scott Foster was the ref. The extender was in for that for that game four. Um, We can get to his stats with the Celtics a little bit later if we want to get into that. Um, But if you remember before and after that game, when Minnesota extended it to five against this Dallas team, Anthony Edwards is like one quote was, I just didn't want to get swept. (laughs) And I think that really is kind of the point of desperation that Dallas was at where collectively it's like, Luka Doncic's name is on the line now. He's getting called out by Brian Windhorse on ESPN about that tunnel. The winners are over there. If you want to be over there, you know, talking about practically staging a whole intervention with the Mavericks team and people in in Luka's personal life about how much he's bitching to the refs. (laughs) So, and then of course with Kyrie, he's got his own... just basically at this point, it feels like centuries long history with Boston as well as the rest of the NBA and his reputation. Um, all of it to say, I think there was a lot of psychological elements in this game that led to 
Dallas just being much more physical, uh, obviously the out rebounding on the boards. I was checking this like overall, the rebounds were uh, 52 31 Dallas to Boston, but through the first three quarters. So the bulk of the time that your starters and your, you know, rotation, your true rotation is in there, it was 38 to 21. So it wasn't just, Hey, Dallas was shooting you know, 50% and Boston was around 30%. It was, they were losing the game on the margins too. And to me, I think that does come down to effort. And you mentioned the rebounding too. Derek Lively only played the first three quarters and almost doubled them up on offensive rebounds. He had seven, the Celtics as a team had four. They just had no answer for him. And you mentioned those margins and this has to be a loss that Joe Bazula is going to be frustrated about because he harps on those margins so much. And you see how important those are. You're losing possessions in a game where, especially when your shot's not falling, like you need as many possessions as you can to try to right that ship. And they didn't do that tonight. I think the other thing too, you know, Derek Lively, uh, this was maybe the, the best, I think obviously the best performance he had of the finals. A, that corner three, who who knew that that he he had that in? I mean, people have been talking about his shot, at least practice wise, but to see it in a game in the finals on this stage, incredible stuff. But also, you, one of the things that Sharp and I talked about after Game Three was that for a lot large portions of that game, it was just Luca and Kyrie. Tonight, we saw Dante Exum had an excellent game off the bench for Dallas. And to get back to your point, defensively. Luca was locked in. There was, uh, I think, Exum had a steal. Josh Green had a steal when Tatum was driving into pain, just swiped it straight out of his hands. That was something that had been pretty much absent, I think, throughout uh, the first three games of this series. If Dallas can keep doing some of that, game five, it can make it real, real interesting. But that's a that's a big if. And I think the other thing, too, I don't think we're going to see this kind of shooting night two nights in a row from the Celtics. And, uh, you know, there's so, so many things have to go wrong. Uh, I think notably a very bad Drew Holiday game, which it, that hasn't happened in a long time. But this Dallas did what they had to do. They needed to extend it. They had to get the job done tonight, literally win or the series is the season is over. So, yeah, you, you have to tip their hats to them. They did exactly what they had to do to keep this thing going. Yeah, I really think it was truly the first Dallas game where you saw the role players show up in a big way. And that's kind of the definition of what you expect a role player to do. Okay, you're in a potential elimination game. You're on your home court. You haven't showed up at all. So somebody like PJ Washington should show up. You know, the lively should be in there and being a big body and raising the physicality of the entire game. I think just because we hadn't seen it to this point, or I hadn't seen it to this point, and, and Boston is up 3-0 on Dallas, I thought, why the hell would Dallas want to go back to Boston? You know, like, why would they want to go go back to TD Garden? And and I think it really just came down to that desperation and the role players showing up. I was wondering your guys' perspective being there in person. Um, Al Horford was really a non-factor offensively, at least through the first half where it felt like most of the game was decided. And... There was so much availability to you guys about Kristaps Porzingis. There he is moving around on the court a little bit yesterday shooting. Oh, there he is walking around. Oh, he's got a sleeve on that leg, but that's not the leg with the injury. What's going on with the other leg? Oh, there he is. You know, he's working out in front of the trainers before the game. Oh, he's available, but it sounds like it's he's selectively available. <laughs> what do you think... Um, what do you expect, I guess, from the entire Porzingis situation? And when you see no discredit to your man Tillman, they're boy. just interpreting because he had some really nice minutes tonight. Like out of everybody, he had a, he had a, for the second game in a row a nice showing for the time he was out there. But when you see Al Horford be slightly negated offensively, do you think that there's a different kind of necessity to go? Okay, is Kristaps Porzingis? actually available or were they just trying to give him a nice moment on the court in what was going to be potentially the championship clinching game watching him warm up there were times where he even said to the training staff that he couldn't do certain things and he kind of winced at certain things so it was obvious he wasn't 100 like like ooh, like like what in particular 
there was some times where he was doing some pick and roll thing and you couldn't really hear it because he would go up to the training staff and say it. We were kind of sitting on the sideline and he would go up and would say stuff. And there were some things that he couldn't do as he was going through his pregame routine. But for the most part, like this wasn't just like a light shoot around that he participated in. Like he was going around the perimeter. He was running up and down the floor, taking threes on the run, doing some post work, really moving on the pick and roll stuff, pick and pop. He was really doing a lot. And it was like a 30 minute session that he was out here before the game. But like I said, there was times where he said he couldn't do that and there were other times where he winced and i did hear him say that it started off good and then it kind of slowed down a little bit so he's clearly not a hundred percent and the rarity of this injury just makes it so confusing right there was that study that since 2000 or documented in 2006 there was a study that 32 cases in the english literature whatever the hell that means i, I don't even know what that means like why like, the English that literature, have been like, have been written in great <laughs> novels by jane austen yeah like, like i don't, I don't know what that means but it is something that could only happen to christoph porzingis in the nba finals but just the rarity of the in injury i just don't know if anyone has a clue i don't even think they have a clue because it's so rare yeah and Terp and i were talking about before the game because again like when joe mazula said in his pregame presser that i think the quote was uh he's we're only going to use him if we use him essentially in very specific situations and we're like there's no way especially if there is a potential game five at that time a potential game five and you need to break the glass you're good that's that's when you use it with porzingis another 48 hours of rest maybe get him back um so I think we'll see, right? We'll see. We don't know, and and who knows how how much that uh, that that leg slash foot ankle works. Um, I think if in terms of getting back to your original question about Horford, if he can play the way he did, he and Tillman, that sort of combination can do in game one. Then I think they'll be all right. I mean, uh, they just completely got outshined by lively especially on, on on the rebounds and that's just that's we i i can't think of a game where we've seen it especially rebound wise like that in the playoffs from horford specifically so I, again that's something i would imagine they would they would fix uh but it's it is that is sort of the gap with porzingis where he is especially talented at uh, at that part of the game in a way that Horford and Tillman uh, just aren't so that, that there is that gap, but uh, it, you, that was that was missed tonight. I also I thought their spacing was pretty atrocious on the floor tonight. I know that's something that Missoula talked about. It was after the first thing the game. Tatum noted too. It was game. it was uh, just from the TV broadcast. It was just like, what are you guys getting trapped in here for? And then it, it was funny because the Mavs on the other side offensively were playing, you know, spread out so much more like a Celtics formation that you typically see from them in spacing. Um, I wondered though, as we dance around the Porzingis stuff, if Porzingis is fifty percent. Does it make sense to you guys to have him out there in game five? Is it Does it feel like a necessity at this point? Because truly, if this game, not to get ahead of, you know, our panic meter that we'll get to, but if this game goes back to Dallas for game six, all of a sudden it feels like a completely different series. I, I think you play Porzingis, uh, you know, percentage-wise, it's, it's kind of a hard thing to say. Only if he's truly healthy, because the other thing about it, it's, you know, he looks good shooting, I think, pregame. He looked pretty good, but to Terp's point, that's only half of the game, right? How good is he going to be transitioning? How good is he going to be shuffling side to side? All of those things, like if he can't do that, you can't put him out there on the floor. So I think that's that's ultimately what it has to come down to. It's like truly how how mobile can he really be? Because sure, if you have a guy who can sit there in the corner and shoot, that's that's great. But if that's all he can do, he's not going to be much help to the Celtics. Yeah, then you might as well have Hauser out there, right? <laughs> he wait, wait, Hauser, uh, Hauser had a great game three. That, that was he, he, Hauser he had, had a Tommy game. point. Okay, Hauser yeah. was like chasing down a loose ball at one point, and I yelled out Tommy point. He got the jump ball off of it. So, what do you what do you think, Terp? In terms of Christoph Porzingis, is it time? Are we at the break glass in case of emergency point in game five with him, or is it something where you roll out the bigs of? 
Horford and Toman and see if you can patch it together for that game. Well, I'd start by saying this. I don't think this is a matter of just pain tolerance. Again, I'm not a doctor, but if this was just a pain tolerance thing, he would definitely be out there. Just the way he's talking, the way he's really trying to be out on the floor, I think this has something that could cause long-term effects if he is to keep working on it. So the Celtics aren't going to put him in that position. They've done that to players before, and it doesn't work, especially in the postseason. We saw it with Isaiah Thomas. We saw it with Robert Williams. They're not going to do that. They're not going to put a player in that position, especially a guy like Christoph Porzingis, who you know is going to be the key for you next year and possibly for years to come. So I don't think this is a matter of pain tolerance. So I think that's why they're keeping it so serious and they're, they're treating it so seriously. And I think it also goes back to yeah. what we were talking about, where like with with what he's what he's what he's worth on the floor, right? It's I don't know. It's just it's not worth it to go out and jeopardize his health if that's if that's the case if he's if he's okay enough to play then it makes sense but if not it's not worth jeopardizing his health yeah and coming in my last thing on Porzingis coming into the series I thought they couldn't win without him um and, and that meant winning four games I when he got hurt you know when he got hurt and then they won the two games or the, the two the game after that, I, I sort of thought about you know, I think they can win two, and then after game three, I think they could win one. I still think they can win one game without Chris Porzingis. They've been doing it all throughout the postseason. I think they can do it one more time against a team that they've shown that besides tonight, they can you know they can handle for the most part. Tonight, a huge aberration, a lot of stuff to fix, and truthfully. You know that sometimes happens. It's, that's just just sometimes the basketball. Your shot doesn't fall. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. You know, but I think they can do it one more time with that combination of of Horford and Tillman. They just have to do, th do what they're supposed to do, and you know, some of the, those shots, some of those bounces have to go their way. And hypothetically, if Kristaps doesn't come back, does this Dallas team beat the Celtics three games in a row after the win tonight? I just don't see it happening. Like they are just far more talented than them. And if it's going to take, obviously, in game two, the Celtics are. So that's two bad shooting nights. And the Celtics, obviously, they, they, the uh, Mavericks couldn't capitalize it on in game two, where they couldn't capitalize on Boston's rough shooting night. Then tonight, it's a bad shooting night, and they do capitalize on it. But if you're looking at like it's going to take the Celtics to shoot this poorly to beat them. Are they going to do it again? Are they going to have? They don't have back-to-back -back clunkers. It just doesn't happen. It hasn't happened all year with this team. So if you're looking at it like that, I don't know. Like they're not going to beat them three more times in a row after this game. I just don't see it happening. I agree, Esteban. I think that was like a really excellent way to to articulate that. Is at the beginning of the series, could you win four games without Kristaps Porzingis? That feels like a tall order. He gave you game one completely with that 20 point first half. And then game two, he was still extremely effective before he had this injury. So if you can get through game three and now game five, I'm not at the panic level with game five at all, which is weird to say coming off of a complete beatdown. Like, I don't know how you come out of this game not feeling demoralized and not taking a hard look in the mirror and going like, did we really just let that happen? You know, like I thought, I thought that we matured past this. I thought that we weren't these guys ever again. And I think that there's some merit to sitting down, obviously crunching the tape and everything. But also a part of me is like, do you just throw this all out and go like, don't even look at that again because that's not representative of who we are. I expect them to win it in game five back in Boston, and I'm excited for that. But I also never saw this coming. I thought, I thought if there was any way that the Mavs pulled this off, it would be because Luca and Kyrie – had an extremely efficient three-point shooting night and it was just, you know, raining on the other side and that you couldn't respond on your side. I didn't think it would turn into this physical defensive battle. Like, I just didn't think that the Mavs had that in them. But it's all to say, like, you know, we can't be right all the time. I'm wrong a lot. But I still think that uh, I still feel pretty good about game five back at TD Garden. Yeah, and I'll say too. Um, I, I was sort of joking with this in terms of the, with Serp in the press box. Um, it's almost kind of reassuring to me when, like, you have 
two people like Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, two of the best people at their job in any job on the planet. And they just have a really bad night. And I'm like, sometimes like I'll screw something up. Like I was, I was screwing some stuff up uh, on my stories, my reporting from here. And, you know, you feel kind of bad about that. And then you see, you know, these world-class athletes do it. It's like, oh, things just happen sometimes. Like, that's just life. Sometimes you just have a bad night. Uh, and again, a lot of stuff to fix, but that's just life. That's just basketball. And you got to move forward. Now, obviously, again, a 48 points deficit. That's a lot of stuff to move forward from. But that that happens. That happens. I will say, too, though, you know, again, I don't I wouldn't say it's panic mode or anything like that. But game five, if there is such a thing like as like a must win, like I think Boston has to win. You cannot come back to Dallas. You need to if you're going to close it out, do it in game five, because if 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 you give this Mavs team any bit of a heartbeat, you know, they they they're they have not supposed to be there in any of the series and they've proved everybody wrong a lot. So if they're going to do it, do it in five because you don't want to come back to Texas against this team. And again, they don't have two stinkers, so I really don't think that's going to be a problem. Like they've proven that they can bounce back repeatedly. They always, every time that they've had a loss like this, they've responded for the most part. And now on this stage, I think there was a sense of, and I don't want to say it was like embarrassment or frustration or worry or anything. I think it was more just disappointment. Like you had a chance to close it out and close out. A, it would have been perfect punctuation to this historic season if you had swept them in the NBA finals, but you had a chance to do that and you fumbled it away. But they know that you still have a big cushion. So you never really want to look at like look at things like that, but it's human nature. You're inevitably going to look at it like, hey, we're up three to one still. We have a chance to go back and close this thing out at home. You can be in much worse situations than the one you find yourself in right now. Because uh, NBC Sports Boston was doing a, a quick interview, like a walk-off interview with Wick after the game and asking him, how he felt about it. And he was saying, well, you know, we're still up three to one and I would much rather be celebrating the championship. I'm paraphrasing here, but we are still up three to one, which is much better than being on the other end of it. And I was thinking to myself, it doesn't feel like three to one because three to one is that impossible deficit that you always see these great battles either in the conference finals or in the finals. And more often I think about the conference finals when OKC gave that up so many years ago, but uh, to the, to the golden state warriors, but all it to say, I, I think it's okay Turp, to say it's worse than disappointment that it's a 38 point loss. That is a bad loss. Even though it's on their floor, it's not on the Celtics floor. It's a bad loss. Like, I didn't think that this team had that kind of loss in them in the postseason anymore. All it to say, I agree with you. We went through this in the regular season so many times. It, they do tend to punch back after they get knocked down like this. So I still expect it's going to be game five. Game five does feel like a rare must win. That's not a game seven. And we will all be there, correct? Monday night, we're all going to be there. That's so right. we'll be back. We'll be back in TD Garden. Um, one other note, because I broke this to Terp Esteban right before yeah. we jumped on because I saw it on Twitter. I'm not sure if you saw this. Charles Barkley announced that he's going to be retiring from TV after the conclusion of the next oh, NBA man. season. I know. So he has like, one more. This, is, this night sucks. <laughs> man. Media deal. This ruining night everything. Sucks this so TV much. deal. Shout out, shout out, Chuck. My my girlfriend Katie and I have uh, I she doesn't care about sport. Well, she doesn't care about basketball almost at all. But I have brought her on the band, the Chuck bandwagon. She loves Chuck. That's how that's how much of a cross cultural phenomenon Charles Barkley is. Man, that's a loss. That's a loss. Shout out, Chuck. Yeah. So I just I thought I would. Break that to you. I knew you'd probably want to hear it from a friend. So yeah. <laughs> we, we, we do have another season with him, but it just is a reminder to cherish inside the NBA because it's the kind of it's the kind of media that we all aspire to be part of, you know. Truly, and truly. so um, I, I, all that to say, it's a late night. Uh, I don't even know what the time zone you guys are in here, but we're basically on to Saturday here on the East Coast. And I will see you guys back on Monday.
Should be a fun one back at the garden. We thought maybe we'd have the duck boat parade, but we'll take another basketball. We'll game. do that it's Wednesday. Not the worst thing for business. We'll do that Wednesday. All right. Uh, this has been Slam. Thanks for listening, guys. As always, like, subscribe, find us wherever you find your podcast and on YouTube as well. And we will talk to you guys in just a couple of days. <laughs>